Hello everyone, my name is Laura. Welcome to The Sun Setting. <laughs> Welcome to Book Bubbler. Let me see if I can do this. Will this help? Not much at all. Professional as always, that's me. Um, hi. I sort of forgot that I had a booktube channel. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I have just been busy and then distracted and I think, oh yeah, I have to film something. I need to really write that down. and then it doesn't happen. I just realized this is on a ring light. Hang on. <laughs> is this better or worse? Worse. That's okay. Um, anyways, hello. How are y'all doing? Um, yeah, it's just been a lot going on between Double Booked Co., my shop with Danny, between massage people, helping my mom with stuff, um, trying to clean my house up a little more, working in the attic. It's been really, really nice working in the attic, um, going through most of my grandparents' stuff. Everything up there is pretty much theirs, but I need to take ownership of it because it's really just mine because I'm the only grandkid and I'm the only one that's going to deal with it and it's in the house that I live in. So yeah, I've been doing lots of that stuff. Been busy. Um, and I have, I think, 10 books to talk about today. I will do that quickly. But in the meantime, um, I'm calling this a June reading wrap up number one, just because it's been three weeks since I've done any reading anything. So I've got three song of the weeks, the songs of the week to backtrack on before I jump into this pile of mediocrity. Okay, so number one, Give Me One Reason by Tracy Chapman. I just like Tracy Chapman a lot. Who doesn't like Tracy Chapman? She's got a great voice and this is Another one of her hits that I think it's lost behind Fast Car sometimes, and Fast Car's great, don't get me wrong, it's my favorite, but yeah. So there's that one. The second one, which is going to be such a huge hit here, and I'm sarcastic, it's uh, Violin Partita number no. 3 in E Major by J.S. Bach. This is the prelude, I'll only link the prelude. Um, it's such a great piece of music. I mean, first of all, the Bachs are amazing as a family. There's like seven generations of composers and there are hundreds of composers and musicians in the family and of course they're all like Johann Bach, Johann Sebastian, Joseph, somebody so it's like the same initials for everybody you know very confusing I tried to figure it out and I couldn't um so I'll try to link either um a, a link for Midori as a performer she's a great violinist super proficient technically like she's just like perfect 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 or I'll try to link Hilary Hahn as well. I like Hilary Hahn a lot. I don't know if it's just her violin or um, if it's her personality or whatever, but she seems a little more aggressive in playing and I like that, it's nice. She's got a little more grit and everything in the bow, she's really putting it into it. And it sounds like, I've been listening to these two, uh, mostly performances these two, um, off and on for the last couple of weeks. And I think Hilary does some different bowing, which I, did not expect at all. I was, I had to keep rewinding to listen and then jump to the same part in Midori's recording to see. And I think Hillary does do something different bowing like a minute and a half in. I don't know. Anyone else notice this too? Anyone else a big um, classical music nerd like I am? Probably not. Um, anyways, so here is some JS Bach for you. No, I don't know which one, but it's one of them. And then the latest one <laughs> just kind of makes me laugh. I know it's sort of serious, maybe serious. I don't know anything about it. I just heard on the radio and I like it. So it's Jiggle Jiggle by Duke and Jones and Louis Thoreau. I just think it's funny. It makes me laugh. So there you go. Have some songs. Okay, now on to my pile of mostly mediocre books. <laughs> okay, um, first up, let's do the three books I don't have copies of anymore. Okay, so the first one was um, ebook only through my library. It's Doctor Who, The Nightmare of Black Island by Mike Tucker. This is um, with the 11th Doctor and Clara. I'm sure you're seeing the cover right now. I don't remember who the companion is right now. I think it's Clara. Um, but I really liked this one a lot. It was properly creepy. It really it gave me the heebie-jeebies, a lot of it. And I like that I there's lots of little callbacks to earlier episodes and things and near the end of this book um, some of this has to do with memory like this bad thing feeds on memories 
like joy and sorrow and everything. So the doctor, of course, takes over and he lets this bad thing in his brain. So you jump back and if you know companions and you've watched from the very, very beginning and everything, he just references little blips of things. There's several sentences in a row of just small stuff that got me a little verklempt, I have to say. It was like, oh, I remember that. Oh, oh, oh. like I just, it was great. Like I said, it was dark. It was creepy kind of sad and touching at the same time. I just really liked it. I, all the Doctor Who books are pretty fun, but I liked this one quite a bit, so I think I gave this one four stars. It was fun. And then two from the library, um, number 28, Game On in the Stephanie Plum series by Janet Ivanovich. There's nothing new here. It doesn't have to be new for me to enjoy it. Um, whenever they come out every year, I'm just excited to see it again. So um, Stephanie this time is tracking... Oh god, who's the big guy she's tracking? He's totally nuts. I want to say his name is Waldo or something. I don't remember. It's awful. Awful. But he is a, a guy who breaks into stuff online. What is that? I want to say it's a code. Like, I don't know. That guy? <laughs> that profession? Um, uh, yeah. Why can't I think of it? It's driving me crazy. Anyways, Laura, move fast. Um, so she's tracking this really bad guy. He missed his court date, and he doesn't want to go back in, of course, to reschedule. She's just trying to track him down. And this guy, they think it's him who is losing his mind, literally, and he's starting to track down this small group of, um, I think they're called the baked potatoes. That's what they are. This group of people that are like, you know, no one really knows each other, but they work online to do, like, white hat cracking uh, websites and stuff. Um... And he thinks the crazy guy, who's like a big time hacker, that's it, got it. Um, he thinks that these people know something they don't really know. So he's trying to take them out and he starts to kill them all. And of course, Stephanie gets involved. Um, of course, more than one car blows up and Luba has an accident with her hair. And I mean, it's the same, but it's always a good time. So I enjoyed that. That was, I think, three, probably three stars. Um, the next one up I read is God Rest You, Royal Gentlemen by Reese Bowen. This is the latest, I think it's the 13th in the Her Royal Spinous series. These are just mysteries um, set in England in like the 1930s. Still, I think it's still the 30s now. Um, so Georgie is married and um, it's their first Christmas as, as, as a married woman on this estate and everything. So she wants to have a very small party just for the Christmas holiday. They invite a lot of people, no one can really come. And then at sort of like a couple of weeks before Christmas, they get an invitation from her husband's aunt who used to live in Yorkshire and now is living somewhere on the Royal Palaces because we're, um, Georgie is related to the Royal family and whatever. Um, so they get invited to a house party that they really can't avoid. They don't really want to go and go to Sandringham and everything for the thing, but they end up going. Um, and it's right when the King is really sick and Queen Mary is relying on Georgie to figure some stuff out again. And so some of that and then dead bodies show up and it was just fun. Again, I mean, nothing revolutionary. It was a really good time. She's a great writer, very, very readable. Um, so glad to have caught up on that. And the next one comes out just in a few months, too. I'm really behind. So those are the ones I no longer have a copy of. Then for the Book 2 Prize, I finally, finally, yesterday, finished the first book. I'm not going to talk about it, but, you know, Facing the Mountain, A True Story of Japanese American Heroes in World War II by Daniel James Brown. He wrote The Boys in the Boat, which I have not read or seen the movie for yet. But this is all about Japanese Americans in World War II, both those that were fighting, um, those that were pacifists, and then following, you're mostly following four boys, because they were boys, um, who joined the army and get sent to war, and then one pacifist who stays here in the States in his story. But then you also get to know all, a lot of their friends and their families and the different concentration camps they were at here in the States and everything. So I finished this. This is my second longest one. I just have one thing tabbed. Um, but I wanted to start out with a chunker out of the way. Otherwise, I would just have all these big ones at the end and I'd be scrambling. So I got this one done. I've already read, already read. Already, let's try this again. Red, another one, only one of them. So I'm going to flip through that one again. That's um, Under a White Sky by Elizabeth Colbert. So I'm going to flip through that again, and then I'm third done. And I'll be starting on, I forget the name of it, but it's by Scott Ellsworth. It's about the 1921 Tulsa um, massacre. So, yeah, well, I'm already having bad dreams from this. I might as well stick with the bad dream stuff. So I finished that. 
felt very accomplished. And then these are in no particular order. So I finished book number six in the Suki Stackhouse series. This is definitely dead. Um, these are just such a good time. So Suki gets um, the okay from a lawyer that her cousin Hadley's apartment is finally ready for her to go through. Her cousin Hadley always had a lot of problems and they weren't terribly close. She was kind of an aggressive little kid. Um, but Hadley became like the girlfriend, the favorite of the Queen of Lu Louisiana, the vampire queen of Louisiana. And um, no one really knows what happened. You know, Suki's been waiting to hear what's been going on. So she gets down to her cousin's apartment. Finally, she lives in New Orleans. Um, she goes down there and starts to go through it. And they get attacked by a new vampire. And a witch helps them. And then there's this attack. And there's a wedding happening between the queen of Louisiana and the king of Alabama. And she starts dating Quinn, who is the weird tiger. I like Quinn. Um, it's just a whole bunch of stuff. Eric and Bill are involved, of course. I, I can't. I don't know what to talk about, but I really, really like this. This was so much fun. This was what I read at night when I was trying to get rid of the nightmares <laughs> before I fell asleep. So, very thankful for this. Um, then I have the second, I think, and this series. This is Wicked Embers by Carrie Arthur. Sorry for the glare here. Um, this is Urban Fantasy series. She is a phoenix. The main character is a phoenix here. And I finished this. I gave it two stars. I was pretty underwhelmed. And I'm DNFing this series and I'm going to get rid of the next series of books I had by Carrie Arthur. Um, just because it seems like if you've read one of her series, you have read all of her series. And that's probably very unfair. And I apologize if she ever sees this. I really like her, your writing. I think you're great. I love your Riley Jensen series. Read that series. It's excellent. Um, this one I was just underwhelmed by. It was just like, yes, there's an overarching theme through all four of the books, but you can see where it's going. She's got a cranky ex who she keeps getting involved with, sort of, because he's sort of involved in this investigation. Um, she's got her partner who they need to have sex on a regular basis because they're phoenixes. They have something about firing and flame. I don't I don't know. So like then that's happening, but she started dating a new guy and then there, maybe he's not really who he says he is and someone's trying to kill her and there's a vampire curse and I don't know. I just... It was just fine. So I'm getting rid of this and the next two books and like I said, the other four. So that's seven books off of my shelves with just this one. <sighs> Y'all, this is the fifth Bridgerton book, To Sir Philip with Love by Julia Quinn. Okay, I like Eloise. I really do. Um, and I was looking forward to this mystery, mystery, this book in this series, excuse me. Um, and I've heard four and five are the best of the series and I really liked four. So this is number five. I was like, great, I'm going to really like this. And I am really on the fence about this book. So if I hadn't, if the events of the last maybe four or five years hadn't happened um, with Me Too and consent being talked about more regularly and all of this stuff, I don't think I would have caught a lot of the issues that I had in this book ultimately. So part of me wants to give it five stars because it was very, very readable. I mean, she's a very readable writer second time I was saying that today, but it's really true. I, they're just enjoyable books. Um, but there's a lot of stuff here with Sir Philip that really just irritated me. Um, an example. So a Marina, we know Marina from the TV show. Marina is his wife. She had um, postnatal depression and ended up killing herself. This is some of the first chapter. I think they tell you this right away. She drowned herself. Philip tried to save her. She lingered for two days and then just passed away. But she was always really sad. And their two kids were, I think, like six and seven or something, seven and eight, you know, kind of that age. And um, they were always very cautious around Marina. And he didn't know what to do to help her. I mean, they're just, that wasn't a thing that people talked about then. It wasn't really known as far as I know. So poor Marina just suffered and then died. So he has been just employing people to take care of his kids and his kids are snotty. They need attention. They need love. They need rules. They need to pay attention to them. And he's just doesn't. He's too busy being a botanist working in his greenhouse on his land out in the country. Um, so after Marina passes, Marina is the cousin of the Bridgertons. Eloise has been writing Philip and she wrote him a letter to just uh, my condolences. I remember her fondly when we were kids growing up. Um, 
you know, if there's anything I ever do for you, let me know. He replied back and then they start talking. So they've been conversing like, or sorry, writing letters to each other for a couple of years. Um, and he sort of says spontaneously, if you would ever consent to marry me, if you want to come out and meet each other, I think we would suit each other very well. And she thinks, yes, this is how I'm going to have a marriage, but not get all involved in this whole love thing. She's 26 at this point. Um, Penelope's married. She's a spinster. She didn't think she'd be lonely and she didn't think she would mind because she thought she'd always have Penelope, but now she doesn't. So she thinks, fine, this is what I'm going to do for myself. I'm going to take care of myself and I'm just going to be an adult and just make a good decision and just get married. So she goes out there, doesn't tell him ahead of time, just shows up and they get along fine, but because Eloise is Eloise and Sir Philip is just really a brute. He really is a brute. He doesn't pay attention to stuff. He doesn't pay attention to her. And ultimately, my opinion here, I don't know, but ultimately he just is so happy in his marriage because Eloise is a happy person and she cares about his kids and, you know, she involves them. She teaches them stuff, discipline, all that stuff. Um, he's so happy that he can go work all day long in his greenhouse and whenever he is, he doesn't get bothered by anybody, then he can come in whenever he's done. They can eat together. He can see the children a little bit. They go to bed and then he can go upstairs and nail his wife. That's why he's happy they're married. And he says it himself a couple of times, especially at the end, like, like right at the very epilogue too. Like he just reiterates it. And it's like, that's not, that's not what a spouse is for. I'm really sorry. And like Eloise deserves better. So again, I don't know if I would have noticed it necessarily if I wasn't more aware of things like everyone is. And that's a good thing. So on the one hand, I really thought this was a one star. On the other hand, I thought it was like a four. So I'm giving this like a two and a half and I feel really badly. I'm going to keep reading this series though. I can't help myself, but yeah, conflicting feelings on this for sure. <sighs> Not so conflicting feelings on this. The Lilac Bus by Maeve Binchy. So I only read the short story, The Lilac Bus. There is a quartet in here, Dublin stories, I think. Um, that's sort of the second half of this book, but this is my first book for over a year. And I just couldn't get myself to read this. I couldn't keep going back to it. It just didn't hold my attention. And ultimately I just came, it just was about nothing. It's about a group of people who live in a small town in Ireland and there's this lilac bus that goes into Dublin once a week or back and forth on like Monday and then come back on Friday night or whatever. So it's about these people and their little lives. Um, they know each other, of course, from town and you hear about everyone's like married to so-and-so and someone left so-and-so and they have this kid and blah, blah, blah. Someone's going to move and someone's losing their business and whatever. So it's small town gossip about each other. And you see parts of their lives in Dublin, what their jobs and what they're doing. This is set in the 30s, I want to say, or 40s. I'm not sure. Um, so it's just a small, gentle story, which is what she does. And I like Maeve Vinci. But I can see how similar they are now. I really, I don't know. So like two stars, it was okay, but I'm not keeping this. And I was initially trying to collect all of Maeve Binchy's works. I mean, going at like library sales and thrift stores and stuff. And I think I'm going to stop doing that and probably get rid of most of the stuff that I have. I loved Circle of Friends. Loved it, loved it. Read it before I watched the movie, just because I'm old. And I loved the movie too. I thought it was great. Um... But I, I'm not really, I don't really care. I've read several of her standalone short stories, like A Week in Winter and things. Those are all fine too, but mm, eh, eh. <sighs> I feel really bad about this unpopular opinion again. The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. You guys, <laughs> this is the book that I have been saving because I wanted to read it. It sounded so good. Like this cover is lovely. I love the little green beetle. Like the title, just apothecary, that word has nice little um, like tones to it and it sounds like there's things you can expect and I think at the friend's apothecary table, you know. Um, so I was really excited about this and I saved this for rainy day and I thought, you know what? No. Read the book of the month club books that you really want to read. Add like one every couple of months. So I pulled this off the shelf and did. I started listening to it as well and the audiobook is fine. Um, this is from March of 2021. So pretty pretty regularly for me this is pretty new um but I was um not overwhelmed or underwhelmed I was whelmed <laughs> whelmed by it 
it's three storylines. One is present day and one is the 18. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. It's 200 years later. Oh, I just saw a year. 17, see, 1791. Um, so we follow present day, this woman who comes, I don't remember her name at all. She comes to London on what's supposed to be their 10th anniversary trip. And um, she's by herself. She left her husband behind. She found out that he's been having a long-term affair with a coworker. So she doesn't know what to do. She, they were trying to get pregnant. She couldn't be pregnant now. She doesn't know. Like she's, you know, so it's, that's all in turmoil. Her marriage is in turmoil, whatever. So she goes by herself on this trip. And like her first day there, some guy asks her to go mudlarking on the Thames. She's like, what's mudlarking? A lark out of a mud? And right away I was, I said out loud, like, oh my God. I mean, I just, <laughs> so it's um, not a good, it was strike against it right away. <laughs> like, Girl, please. Um, so she goes mudlocking and she finds a glass bottle with a bear etched into it and she gets intrigued by this so she asks the guy who's in charge of that particular trip who has some like stereotypical quirky nickname I don't remember and he says oh I don't really know but congratulations for finding something um you should talk to my friend blah blah who's got like a man's name but it's a woman who works at um the library one of the libraries in London I think or one of the museums I forget doesn't matter so she goes over there and says oh blah blah referred me to come look this up can you help me figure out what this is from when this is from she's like oh sure we've seen this before blah 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 so there she's researching the story of this bottle and trying to figure it out and the bottle is from this apothecary shop not so spoiler alert so then in the 1790s we get the apothecary's voice we get her in chapters and we also get her little um, helper Nellie. Nellie is 10 or so. Um, Nellie comes in to buy a potion for her mistress to kill the mistress of this woman's husband and that's whatever. So the whole point of this apothecary shop, it was a proper apothecary shop started by this lady's mother. She passed away and slowly this woman who's taken it over does makes poisons for women to try and get out of bad marriage so she only kills men she never kills women she says no to this killing this mistress the lady causes a fuss they have to like fix a bunch of stuff give they give her the potion and accidentally the husband drinks it and then they're trying to figure out who gave this poison like her shop gets fingered that's terrible it's like pointed out sort of like it's narrowing in on her <laughs> The drama back and forth, the little girl hanging around. She doesn't really want her around. Blah, 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 blah. I was underwhelmed at the end. I was whelmed in the beginning, not knowing what, what mudlarking is, going to England. That was a major strike against her. And I'm sorry if things sound snobby, but it's like, girl, come on, come on. And there were a couple other times when I was listening I, out loud, I said, really? Like, I, I don't know. And uh, to be fair, Sarah Penner, kudos to you. Absolutely. You got a hit on your hands for your first book. That is the author's dream, right? That's excellent. Good work. Good job, you. This is also the kind of book that I can see myself writing the first time I tried to write a fiction book. Like trying to make things twisty, not really knowing how to like show it versus tell it sometimes. I could very well see this being something that I could do. And I don't know. I want better than what I could do. So I, I gave this like a 2.75 or something or a two and a half, a three stars on Goodreads. I think I rounded it up, but I was just, it was fine. It was fine. I don't know. Did you guys read this? Probably. And then the last one I have to talk about, thank God, 23 minutes. Lordy, Lordy. Um, and I'm not going to say much about this one. It'll be short. This is the third in the Essex Sisters Quartet of books, uh, The Taming of the Duke by Eloisa James. I love this series. I really, really do. The second book was fine. I liked it. It was two or three stars I gave it, but the first one was four stars. This is four stars. Um, I'm not going to say anything about it, really, other than it's kind of twisty. And, I mean, it's good. I'm almost done with the fourth one right now, and that's really a delight as well. So this is one of my favorite series of hers, for sure. If you haven't read this series, I really recommend it. Um, I've only been reading romance for three years now, maybe. And um, Eloisa James is one of my favorite authors. She's like a classic, a standby. She's always reliable. And it seems like every other series I read of hers is either really, really great or meh. And this one is really great. I think these were first published 
bear with in 2006 so you know mid knots mid aughts whatever um but yeah really great lots of fun hard to stop reading so i think that's me <laughs> i think that's plenty of me um how are y'all doing i'm all right um have to work i came from work today hence my super awesome polo i have to work tomorrow on saturday and um help my mom with some yard work and stuff and drop her laundry off and blah. <sighs> Reading wise, I am working on the last Essex Sisters book. I'll finish that tonight, probably in bed. And I am working on book two prize. That's my main focus right now. So I really want to get as many read as possible and have to renew as few as possible. <laughs> right now they're all due on um, this coming Tuesday. So if I can get at least one more done, aside from the skim through, over the weekend, I'll be very happy, um, but we'll see. So I'll shut up now. I um, hope you've all been doing well. I hope you didn't mind my rambling about all this stuff. And I have several videos I have filmed and not scheduled, not edited to add in anything. They're just sitting here. I need to really get on that and make that a priority. So maybe I'll work on that on the weekend too. Anyway, all right, take care you guys. And hopefully I will see you very soon in the next one. Bye.